Good, welcome back from the coffee break for the final session of today. So Maget is an ESR with uh, Chloe Arzencott, who unfortunately cannot be here um, due to sickness, uh, but we are very happy to have Maget here and uh, report on her work. Yeah. The floor is yours. So hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here to, pro to present a part of my PhD project. So I am Maget, uh, ESR 11, and I'm supervised by Chloe Agat Azencott, who's not here today. Um, so I'm a PhD student at Min Paris Tech in Paris and at the Institut Curie. And today I'm going to present, uh, I'm going to talk about learning from multimodal data to improve cancer treatment. So the presentation today will be divided into four parts. The first, I will uh, talk about the context of the study, then I will present the method, then the result, and uh, at the end, the conclusion and perspectives. So as general context, so today we are going to talk about breast cancer. So breast cancer is the most uh, common cancer among women, and it is characterized by uh, the fact that it's a highly heterogeneous disease. So uh, we can have different uh, molecular subtypes for breast cancer. The first one I will talk about is called uh, luminal A. And here it's characterized by the uh, presence of hormone receptors here, estrogen and progesterone, and the absence of HER2. So these hormone receptors uh, controls the, grow of, uh, the growth of the cancer cells. And for the luminal A, it constitutes uh, the most common cancer uh, in breast cancer cases. And it has a good pronostic because here we have a target. We have a target for all the treatments. And for the second subtypes, it's called uh, it's uh, the human epidermal growth factor receptor two positive. When it's combined by the absence of the hormone receptors, it's called non-luminal. And when it's combined by the presence, it's called luminal B. And here is 15% of the breast cancer cases. Here also we have a quite good pronostic because of the advent of the HR2 targeted treatment. And the last one is called TNBC or triple negative breast cancer. Here, we don't have the presence of the uh, hormone receptor or the uh, HER2. So uh, it has a bad pronostic, actually, because we don't have a clear target for the treatment. Now, depending on uh, those uh, molecular subtypes, so we have different pronostic, but we also have different treatment strategies. So clinicians will use multidisciplinary approach or a combination of uh, therapies. And uh, at the Institut Curie, we uh, usually use the combination of the chemotherapy and the surgery. And depending on which one comes first, we have two types of chemotherapy. We have the neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the adjuvant chemotherapy. The neoadjuvant chemotherapy is done before the surgery. And here the aim is to reduce the tumor size before the surgery in order to have a non-invasive surgery. And the adjuvant chemotherapy, the aim is to kill the remain cell after the surgery. So after those treatments, uh, how the uh, clinician can say that the uh, treatment has gone well, we measure uh, several endpoints. The first one is called pathological complete response. So it's defined by disappearance of the invasive cancer cell after the after completion of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And we also have two other endpoints, two other survival endpoints, so the overall survival and the relapse-free survival, so which is the length of time uh, from the date of the diagnosis of the, or the first treatment that the patient is still alive. And for the relapse-free survival, it's that the patient is still alive, but with any, any sign of cancer or any sign of, of uh, relapse. So in that context, I... Uh, we present the pre-core multimod project, so which is a project with uh, different databases. So the first one is called Database 1. It contains the information relative to adjuvant chemotherapy, and it has 15,150 patients. And we also have the Elias database, uh, which are basically uh, all the reports, all the free text reports that are written by the clinician. Uh, so we extract for this project the records that belong to the same patient from the database son. So we have here a multimodal data set when we have structured data with database son and free text data uh, with database alias. 
And the objectives of uh, PrEPRO multimode will be to identify and to evaluate pronostic factors uh, using a multimodal data set. So here I will use the relapse free survival status as an endpoint for my prediction. So the methods that are used for it. So here I'm presenting uh, the pipeline. So first, uh, analyze and extract the data, then do the pre-processing. And then I did uh, multimodal learning and then do the interpretation and evaluation of the, uh, of the uh, pronostic factors. So first let's talk about the data from the two database. So uh, for the database, uh, I have structured data. So I have uh, over there clinical information. Uh, we have 162 feature. Uh, for this, uh, for the clinical uh, d database, and we have also biological measurement, which are these tumor markers and the human markers, and uh, these uh, these features are sequential uh, sequential features, uh, and I also have for the Elios uh, database free text reports, and each patient has six to around six hundred report. Uh, in his folder. So for the pre-processing of the uh, data set, so for the structured data, the clinical information, I use the uh, feature uh, with uh, the more value. And for the biological measurement, I uh, extract statistical features, uh, the mean, the variance, the max, et cetera, and other features such as the alert because we have the normal range of the biological measurement. And for the free text reports, I use for the prediction the TF-IDF of the biograms. So the TF-IDF will measure the frequency of the biogram and the importance of that biogram within the, the corpus. And I was also able to extract another modality called frequency of events because we have the name of the event in each report of patients. So I was able to say the, to, to have the occurrence of unique events for each patient. Uh, now for the methods part, I'm doing multimodal learning. So Integration methods uh, are important for the multimodal learning. And the first uh, integration method uh, I'm going to present is called early integration. So for this uh, method, we uh, compute, uh, we perform, we uh, concatenate all the modalities into one big input and then uh, compute a machine learning method and then do the prediction and the interpretability. And for the late integration here, we, uh, we do the machine learning for each modality. And then the prediction will be a majority vote uh, between the three, uh, the three machine learning models. So the first uh, models that I use uh, was random forest. So here you can see that I have a highly imbalanced data set. So for that, I use a random forest as the baseline and I perform uh, sampling methods uh, with the random forest still. So uh, the first one, it's balanced random forest. And here, um, it, uh, during the uh, construction of the random forest, it downsampled uh, the uh, majority class in order to balance the, boost, the bootstrap uh, sample. And for the smooth and the random forest here, the smooth will oversample the min minority class. It will create synthetic uh, data set that uh, look like the minority class. And I also uh, aggregate the balanced random forest and the smooth random forest. And I did the prediction on the test set in order to have the uh, accuracy and then identify the predictive feature. Another model that I used also was the neural network. So here I uh, used the same train and validation set in order to compare afterwards. And also I did the hyperparameters tuning with Keras tuner and train with balanced batches uh, in order to tackle the imbalanced data set. 
So another part that is important in this project is the interpretability. So uh, for the random forest, we will use the, uh, the built-in uh, random forest interpretation uh, algorithm. And for the feed forward, feed forward neural network, uh, I will use SHAP and LIME. So, uh, so LIME, it's uh, similar to SHAP. So it would do a local interpretation. Uh, it will uh, perturb like a, a instance uh, and learn an interpretable uh, model locally around the prediction as an interpretation. So these two uh, methods, so these two methods are uh, performing local interpretation, except uh, maybe SHAP, but we will take into account here the, only the local interpretation. And then I also uh, did the global aggregation of uh, those local explanation. So uh, here to perform the global aggregation, the first method of aggregation, uh, it's called the LIME aggregation. It was uh, uh, it was uh, given by the people that uh, uh, that uh, uh, wrote the Lime uh, the Lime uh, algorithm. So here, the uh, first method will be the square root of the sum of uh, the attribution uh, of the uh, feature J over all the instance I. And uh, so here with the first method, when it's about text, it can be uh, biased because when we have like, when we have a word that occur uh, many times, we will have a larger, a larger uh, uh, aggregation uh, uh, score. So that's why I use also the second method of aggregation because here I will do the aggregation uh, uh, methods on text data. So here, the second method, I use the Lime aggregation average uh, over the occurrence of the word here. And the third method of uh, global aggregation here, it's called average attribute. It's the final, it's the mean attribution with the N instances. And that's the third one. It's the one that is used uh, for SHAP, for, exa for example. And I will evaluate all those global aggregation, uh, all those uh, global explanations, sorry, uh, by using something called the AOPC curve. So the AOPC will, uh, will plot how the score uh, is going to change when we remove the supposed uh, top feature that are given by the, by the global aggregation. And... Uh, here, I'm going to show the result of the model. I'm, plot, I'm showing here the mean score. Uh, so here for the early integration, uh, we see that uh, we have similar AUC score, but that the baseline, which means the random forest without any sampling method, outperform all the others. And for the late integration, here for the structured data, uh, the same thing happened with the baseline, which is the random forest without any sampling methods. And the same happened also with frequency of event and text data and, and text data as well. So for the late integration, when we will take the majority vote between the, the, the three models, the structure, the text and the frequency data. Uh, so here, uh, I perform weight, uh, weighted late integration when the contribution of the model will be proportional to the, to the, to the score of those models. And uh, we uh, end up with a score that is uh, quite great, or 0, 0 0.79. And when we compare the early integration to the late integration, it is similar in terms of F1 score, but here the early integration has a higher uh, IUC curve. Now for the interpretation here, I'm showing the most important feature that are uh, from the random forest building algorithm. And here I'm showing the result of the global aggregation. Here, the first one using uh, the lime importance, the average importance, and there the average of attributes. So. I perform it for the lime and for the SHAP. And here it's maybe not clear, but I'm showing uh, the 10 most uh, biogram uh, that the, all the 
Gale, all the aggregation method has shown to be the most important one. And I compare also a SHAP to a LIME to see if I can see, uh, see uh, bigrams that are in common. And we can see that there are different bigrams that we can see both in SHAP and in LIME, such as a certain doctor's name and uh, other, uh, other, uh, other bigrams that are really uh, reliable from a medical point of view. And here to evaluate the, uh, the global aggregation, uh, I'm plotting uh, if we remove the top uh, feature predicted by a uh, with SHAP, uh, we see that the average uh, importance increased the performance. So here, the all the 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 the, the one with the dot is the uh, baseline when we remove uh, random features. So here we can see like the the two above line and average. Uh, attributes has shown a good result. Only the average uh, importance has uh, increased the, the, the performance. So as a conclusion and perspective, so the pers first perspective here that I am currently working on is to try a more complex model in order to improve the performance. So I'm currently working on uh, BERTS, which is uh, adapting the electronic health record for, uh, for adapting BERT for electronic health record. So here we can see that we can have sequence of event when we take the electronic health record, which will correspond to the history of the patient. So the token here would be the event that happened in, in a day for a patient. So uh, that's the perspective for now. And as conclusion, uh, here random forest, uh, for random forest resampling uh, methods didn't show uh, improvement regarding score. So the random forest is quite robust for the data that I have. And the different integration methods used are similar in terms of scores. I also have uh, SHAP and LIME that show uh, similarities regarding the predictive features, so for text reports, and also the global aggregation model uh, methods use work in general according to AOPC. So maybe we should, uh, I should try uh, other interpretation methods, or using BERT, I will have other uh, other information such as attention score for the events. So I will be able to compare what I will have with attention score to what I had uh, for the global aggregation methods. So that was it uh, for me today. Uh, I would like to thank my supervisor, Chloe, and some colleagues here, all the CBO members or my lab members and all the uh, ITN uh, members. Thank you for attention, and if you have questions, I will be happy to take them. Thank you, Margit, for this talk. And now we have a time for questions. Jan is first. Thank you, Margit. I, I found the presentation very super clear, so thank you. I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, for the first one, in your use case, it seemed that early integration and late integration performs quite similarly, maybe early integration slightly better. Do you think that it is context specific uh, or which integration methods would you recommend and why? Um, actually, uh, I will recommend both methods, to be honest, because um, like for the early integration here, the advantage would be that all the modalities will work together to uh, be able to give the best prediction. And for the late, the thing, the fact that uh, we have, uh, we perform machine learning methods for each modality will be specific to one modality. So it can work as well. So both of them work. Uh, I will recommend both of them, uh, actually, because uh, they have uh, advantages. So it will just depend on the data that you will have. So I see. Thanks. And, and my second question was, um, do you have any idea of uh, intermediate integration method? 
So uh, we talk about we thought about uh, intermediate uh, integration mo uh, method. Um, so I didn't uh, do it yet. So it's about kernel. Uh, so uh, it will be a multiple kernel learning when each kernel will learn a model T. Uh, I didn't do it yet, but it's an option to uh, try the intermediate uh, integration uh, method too. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, a short question from us. A great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have you tried methods like uh, stack generalization for late integration? It's an old method, I think, described in the 80s, where a learner learns from the predictions, basically, of the input learners. Mm. And like a neural network, for example, can be any sort of algorithm. Because yeah. you did begging, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. Mm. No, I didn't try it yet, mm -hmm. but I would like to yeah. see if they, it would be an impact uh, with that. Maybe as a comment, if you do early fusion, there is a certain risk in clinical reality that if you lack data that the model becomes not applicable anymore yeah because um, yeah you need to have all the data otherwise you cannot apply it <laughs> thank you further questions for maget giovanni Thank you, Maget, for the talk. I have a very quick question, uh, more of a curiosity, on the aggregation methods of the local explanation. Could you explain again the third one? I'm not sure I understood correctly how it works. Like, do you just average the features over the data set and then use that as the... I just sum all the, uh, all the weight, sorry. I sum all the weights of uh, a feature of the, the, all the local explanation for a feature over like all the instance that we see uh, the the feature. Oh, okay. So okay. that's the the method that Shep Shep have, and even if I compare with uh, here, when I compare with Shep, we have uh, the same top features. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, right on. Well, another <laughs> quick question is, uh, when you were comparing the area and over the perturbation curve, okay, so maybe it should be interesting for just a future analysis, because uh, when you are removing a feature, for example, in the base random forest, mm -hmm. maybe uh, to recompute the relevance for the new model, because uh, what could be happening is that the random forest just is picking one, uh, the top feature, and then when you remove it, it, it there is picking another uh, feature that is highly correlated with the one that you remove because uh, random forest yeah. is not very good for fair attributions or relevances. Mm. And maybe the, the SAP, if you are using something like perturbational, is capturing the top uh, distributing the, uh, the relevances across the correlations more fairly than the random forest or something like that. Okay. 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 Does it address it? Okay. Good. Hi. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Are you also considering um, integrating images like mammography at some point? Uh, for now, I have, uh, so I have 15,000 patients and I have a uh, mammography for only 300 of them. So uh, it will be complicated to perform maybe deep learning with only 300 uh, patients. But uh, we are looking for like multimodal data set that have uh, images in it and with more instances. But for now, we're just going to stop here with uh, the text and the structured data because we don't have enough mammographies, uh, mammography images. Thank you. Yeah. Just, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, really nice talk. No, I was just a bit. Um, Right. Yeah, curious, because you said that you include the doctor's name or identifier as a yeah. feature. And um, doesn't that introduce some sort of bias? Because, I mean, there is 
an inherent that's bias in how doctors evaluate. And okay, it's quite a yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, that's a good question because we were thinking about like if uh, there is a doctor that usually take care of like the most complicated patient, it's normal that we see them here for the relapse. So another another way to deal with that was to, uh, instead of taking the doctor names, is to take maybe the service or or maybe the name of uh, the specialty of the doctors and replace the specialty uh, into the corpus and uh, try to perform that. But I have, I had this comment from the clinician. Uh, so it's a, yes. it's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, because I mean, but even I think with the specialty, if the doc, I mean, if someone is specialized in, in more extreme and yeah. more difficult cases that have lower survivor rate or whatever, like, or yeah. Yeah, recovery, then mm -hmm. I think the models will pick up on that, mm -hmm. or by, I would expect. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Um, just a quick question following up on the, on the reports. Uh, have you cleaned the text somehow or you just calculated the bigrams? Um, so how did you uh, process the, um, the reports? Because also thinking about synonym mapping and so on. Thanks. So I cleaned the text. It's hard to clean uh, actually uh, reports because we have different types. We have different doctors and they all have their own jargon. So uh, I did the uh, like the basic uh, pre-processing for text, like removing uh, the uh, most common words, etc. And uh, uh, so the doctor names is inside the, the, the corpus. So uh, I was not aware until the, the results, so that's why, but I did the processing like the basic one when we, uh, when we deal with uh, NLP. So remove all the stop words and all, all, all that stuff. But no pseudonymating. Sorry? Pseudonym mapping. For, for the YouTube, I, I repeated, no pseudonym mapping was the question. No synonym mapping, no. Okay. Good. So then let's thank Margette again and uh, move on to the next speaker.